Now let's summarize the ideas around using action to conquer fear and to build confidence and get moving towards success. First, be active, not passive. Strive to be someone who does things. Be a doer, not a donter. Don't wait until conditions are perfect to act. Conditions will never be perfect. Expect future obstacles and difficulties and solve them as they arise. Remember that ideas alone won't bring success. It's important to dream, but your ideas have value only when you act on them. Use action to cure fear and gain confidence. Do what you fear doing, and the fear of doing it disappears. Try it and see. Don't waste time getting ready to act. If you have trouble getting started, use the mechanical method to move your spirit. Don't wait for the spirit. We're talking about self-confidence and the things that help build it as well as the things that can destroy it. One of the major obstacles to building self-confidence is often your own memory. Lack of confidence is one result of what I call a mismanaged memory. Here's how a mismanaged memory works. Your brain is a lot like a bank. Every day you make thought deposits in your mind bank and these thought deposits grow and become your memory. When you settle down to think or when you face a problem, in effect you say to your memory bank, what do I already know about this? Your memory bank automatically answers and supplies you with bits of information relating to this situation that you've deposited on previous occasions. Your memory, then, is the basic supplier of raw material for your new thought. Now, the teller in this memory bank of yours is very reliable. He does exactly what you tell him to do. If you approach him and say, Mr. Teller, let me withdraw some thoughts I deposited in the past proving I'm inferior to just about everybody else, he'll say, right away, sir. Recall how you failed two times previously when you tried this? Recall what your sixth grade teacher told you about your inability to accomplish things? Recall what you overheard your fellow workers saying about you last week? And so on and so forth. This teller will continue digging out of your brain thought after thought that proves you're inadequate. But suppose you visit this memory teller and you give him this request. Mr. Teller, I face a difficult situation. Can you supply me with any thoughts that will give me reassurance? And again, the teller says, right away, sir. But this time, he delivers thoughts you deposited earlier that say you can succeed. Recall that excellent job you did in a similar situation before? Recall how much confidence Mr. Sawyer placed in you. Recall the respect your friends have given you for your abilities in this area, and so forth. Your teller lets you withdraw the thought deposits that you want to withdraw. After all, it's your bank. So there are two specific things you can do to build confidence through efficient management of your memory bank. First, deposit only positive thoughts in your memory bank. After all, everyone faces plenty of unpleasant, embarrassing, and discouraging situations. But unsuccessful and successful people deal with these situations in opposite ways. Unsuccessful people dwell on them and make them prominent in their memory. They don't take their minds away from them. At night, the unpleasant situation is often the last thing they think about. Successful people, on the other hand, don't give these situations another thought. Once they've gotten through them, they don't put them in the forefront of their memories. Quite the contrary, successful people specialize in putting positive thoughts into their memory banks. Imagine what would happen to your car's engine if you scooped up a handful of dirt every morning and put it into the crankcase. That engine would soon be a mess. It wouldn't be able to do what you wanted it to. Negative thoughts have the same effect on your mind and your confidence. They produce needless wear and tear on your mental motor. They put you on the side of the road while others drive ahead. So get in the habit of depositing positive thoughts into your memory bank. Just before you go to sleep, count your blessings. Recall the many good things you can be thankful for. Your family, your friends, your health. Recall the good things you saw people do today and the good things you heard them say. Recall your own personal victories and accomplishments, large and small. Go over the reasons why you're glad to be alive. The second thing you can do to build confidence through efficient management of your memory bank is to withdraw only positive thoughts from it. When you're alone with your thoughts, driving your car or having a quick lunch, or maybe on a business trip alone in the evening, don't dwell on whatever problems or troubles may be in your life at the moment. Remember instead, 
the positive things, the good times you've had, the successes, the reasons that you're doing as well as you are. Mental health professionals tell us that some people create, in effect, their own private museums of mental horror by excluding positive thoughts from their memories and dwelling on negative ones to the point of obsession. These are obviously extreme cases, but many of us tip the balance to the negative in our memory banks, and that can often impede our personal progress. And whether the psychological problem is big or little, the cure comes when you learn to quit drawing negatives from your memory bank and draw positives instead. Don't build mental monsters. Refuse to withdraw unpleasant thoughts from your memory bank. When you remember situations of any kind, concentrate on the good part of the experience. Forget the bad. If you find yourself thinking about the negative side, turn your mind to something else. Take a nap, go for a bike ride, work in the yard. You don't need negative thoughts. You can live much better on a pure diet of positive ones. The encouraging thing that you'll discover if you practice these attitudes is that your mind will cooperate with you. Your mind really doesn't want the negative thoughts. If you ignore them, your teller will eventually cancel them out of your memory bank. One of the most common mental monsters we build is our impression of other people and how we measure up to them. People often fear other people. Why is it? Why do so many people feel self-conscious around other people? And what can we do about it? Fear of other people is a big, big fear. But there is one way to conquer it. You can overcome that fear if you learn to put people into proper perspective. I remember when I was inducted into the Army back in 1942. I was a very shy, confused young man, and I thought that everybody was bigger than I was, stronger, smarter, in every way superior to me. And uh, my experience in the induction center really taught me something different. I saw maybe a thousand people come through there who were tall, skinny, smart, dumb. In any event, they were all just almost as confused as I was. In fact, in many cases, much more confused. So I started gaining a sense of worth about myself, realizing that the people that I'm are my peers are just as confused and just as scared as I am about this world that we're entering into. When this event became real is when you enrolled yourself. Before that, it was an idea. And there's lots of people who intended to be here, intended, but they never locked it in. So I lock it in advance, because if I hadn't locked it in after date with Destiny, there's no way I would have got on a plane, flown all the way there, and then put myself in a room for seven days and nights. But I'm grateful I did. And I only did it because I already locked in place. So I encourage you, number one, figure out at least twice a year, what are you going to go to that's going to make you grow and expand? How many of you feel like these last couple days have been some of the most growth you've had in a couple of days here? Say, I then why settle for this one time? Again, I'm happy to do it with you. I have other programs if you want to come, but you're not limited to me. I don't care where you go. But before you leave here, you should schedule what's next. Do you know why? Because how many were looking forward to this for a long time? I'm very excited about this. I'm curious. How many were quite scared about this shit? By the way, I'm curious. <laughs> but here's what's interesting. After you achieve a goal, have you ever done this? Worked your ass off, achieved a goal, and you feel good? And then there's kind of a drop because we need something compelling to be going after so we keep growing. So I always, right before I achieve a goal, I immediately set what the next thing is and I lock it into my schedule because otherwise there's that drop. And if I have the next thing, it's like you're going from peak to peak as opposed to peak to drop to peak to drop. How many follow I'm talking about here? Say I. And the other thing I've learned, I taught this to all my children. And one time my daughter was talking to me, she's like, Dad, you know, you're so brilliant. And I said, You're absolutely right. <laughs> And I said, honey, you know, I am a smart human being. I've worked hard to be a smart human being, but probably my greatest gift is I do not let opportunity escape my grasp. If there's an opportunity and it scares me, if there's an opportunity and I don't have the time, if there's an opportunity and I don't have the money, in the early days of my life, all three of them, I didn't have time, the money, and I was fearful. I make myself do it because I know that if I don't get myself to do that, I'm not going to keep growing. My teacher, Jim Rohn, used to teach me this. He said, Tony, if you really want to have an amazing life, you got to learn to stretch yourself. I said, well, I do stretch myself. He goes, but let me give you my philosophy of stretching. He said, stretching means if you find yourself saying I can't do something, then you must say I must do it immediately and do it with no hesitancy. Because if you hesitate, it's like the firewalk. If you went up to the firewalk, most of you got up there, made your move and rock. Some of you got up there like, fuck, 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 oh, shit, shit, oh, oh, what am I doing here? And the longer you wait, the what it is. 
harder it is. So you just train yourself to just do it. Instinctively push yourself. So if I say I can't, then I must. Now, when he first told me this, I said, well, if I can't, I must. If I can't jump off a cliff, then I must. He said, no, be intelligent. But he said, if you find yourself saying I can't do something, I don't want to do something, but you know if you made yourself do it, you're going to be a better human being, then you must do it. Don't hesitate, do it immediately. And so some people say, well, that's not a very safe life. That's not a very secure life. If you want security, go to prison. If you want freedom, this is how you live. So once you've got events where you're going to make huge growth, the next thing you want to do, throw it up to number two, is you really want to get yourself a coach or a mentor. Why do you want a coach or a mentor? You're smart. Well, I got a series of mentors. I've got three men in my life who are the smartest humans I know. Some of the most successful people in the world in business, spiritually, emotionally well-developed. They're 18 to 20 years my senior. And guess what? I come to them all the time for accountability and feedback. Because as much as I know to drive myself, you don't do brain surgery on yourself even if you're a great brain surgeon. Does it make sense? You need some feedback from the outside because you're still in it. And so getting a coach is critical. Now I get paid a million dollars a year to coach someone and I only take on seven clients and I got now a five year waiting list. So I'm not looking for any coaching clients, but I've trained all my coaches to do the same things I do and they don't charge a million dollars a year, not even close. So you can use our coaches if you want or someone else, but what you don't want to do is have a friend be your coach. Why? I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years back, I was on this talk show that's in the morning. I won't mention the name, but it has a bunch of ladies. What's the name of it? The View. That's right. I won't mention it. And I was on The View, and it was when Barbara Walters was still on. And Barbara was a brilliant, amazing lady. And they had me on in January, and I was doing a piece on New Year, New Life, how to transform your energy and your body. And when I was done talking, it was a little seven-minute segment. All four, five women, I guess it was, five women followed me into the green room, literally, during the break. And they said, listen, before the TV comes back on, we want to do this. You know, tell us more. How are we going to do this? And we want to do this together. And when they said they wanted to do it together, I was like, hold it. I said, can, can I be direct with you on this? I said, Barbara, you know how much I respect you and all of you, but can I be direct? They said, well, yeah. I said, well, I respect you. You're some of the best in the world we do as journalists. I said, you have an incredible show, number one of your show. You've been in the years. Barbara, you're a role model for anyone who wants to be successful man or woman, but there's an area of your life none of you have mastered. It's your body. I'm not being harsh. I have to tell the truth because the truth is how you get to the things to change. And you should have seen him look around and be like, oh my God, he just said we're fat. I didn't say they're fat. I said, you haven't mastered this area of your life. And I said, here's the problem. If you guys get together now and none of you have mastered this area and you're all friends, you'll do this for two or three days. But about the third or fourth day in, one of you's going to go, I want to go to Starbucks and have a mocha, smoke a something, something, fuck, whatever that shit's called, right? And someone else can say, no, we got to work out. And they go, but look, can't we just stop for a few minutes? And then someone else will say, well, we could stop for a few minutes. And then you're fucked because you'll break the pattern. I said, have you ever done this before? And they started shaking their heads. They said, it's happened multiple times. I said, don't do this together. I know you love each other. That's why you shouldn't do it together. Get a professional. When you go, I want to mocha smoke, they'll go, shut the fuck up and run! You need someone who's not going to listen to your bullshit and is going to push you until you develop the discipline, until you develop the skill. And even then, they're going to know the little things, the two millimeter things you don't know that could save you a decade. How many follow this? Say I. So don't get a good coach, get an outstanding one. And the problem is I created the coaching industry. Before I came along, no one called himself a coach in this industry. There wasn't this industry. You had to be a therapist and you got to prove by insurance. And I came along and said, these therapists are sitting down with people for seven effing years and I can wipe out that phobia in 20 minutes or an hour. And so I went around and I said, I got to figure out who I am. I'm not a motivator. I never was. You know, I'm not a guru. What am I? And I thought, well, as an athlete, who influenced me the most were my coaches. And many of them were not as good as I was, but I'm in the game. I'm in the forest. They're outside of it. They could see things and give me cues and they cared about me. So I said, that's what I am. Forget athletics. I'm a coach. I love people. I'm not better than they are, but I'm going to see things they can't see because this is my focus, right? And so I did that. And for many years, I called myself a coach. No one did. And I remember I was on Larry King Live and I just started coaching President Clinton. And he goes, what is this coaching thing? You're not a coach. You don't coach athletes. I said, well, actually I do. But I said, no, here's what I mean by coach. And I was about to give it up. And like within the next six months, everybody was a coach. Therapists started calling themselves coaches. Financial planners started calling themselves coaches. It became a term of art. Now I hate it. You know why? There's no standard, right? Anybody can say they'll call themselves a coach. Anybody go out there and do it. They go to some class. Some idiot teaches them three skills. They never produce the fucking result in their life. And they're a coach. So I feel like I created a bastard industry. And so like any industry, there's good and bad. You got to find 
find somebody who's outstanding. Don't settle for somebody who's good, and don't settle for somebody because you like them. Because liking them is a nice thing. You need somebody who has the skill to get you there. Who's with me on this? Say I. And why do we want a coach? So you measure at least twice a month, some of you three times a month. Because if you don't measure, you can't manage what you don't measure. Does that make sense? And you gotta measure it, and it's easy with your children, with your life, with your businesses. You're gonna get caught up. You need somebody helping you to stay on target for what you want for your life. How many follow? Say I. And it's cheap. Most coaching is inexpensive, and the people that overcharge don't go to them. But get somebody who's really great. And then finally, thirdly, and this is what I want to show you this morning, you need a daily practice. And a daily practice that's going to put you in the best state possible regularly. And so there's two parts of the daily practice. One is you want to feed your mind every day for at least 30 minutes. And when I say feed your mind, my teacher Jim Rohn used to say, miss a meal, but don't miss reading for 30 minutes. And I don't mean reading the web or your social media bullshit or Twitter. I mean reading a real book that you've selected because it's going to make you grow spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially. Something that makes you think, something that gives you a strategy, not some cute little blog post that you can read in five minutes. I mean something that's going to make you not be mental candy, something that's going to produce a different result. Because our lives are the result of the input. Input a bunch of garbage, you get garbage out. So I, I would like never miss reading, and then I started listening to audios when I was really young. And the great thing about audios is you can do what I call net time no extra time. So the biggest challenge we have is when am I going to read? When am I going to do this? When am I going to do all these things? The answer is it doesn't take any extra time. If you use net time, you can do it while you're cleaning the house, while you're working out, going for a walk, when you're driving in your car should be your new university, where you're feeding your mind. Because if you don't feed your mind, weeds grow automatically. You don't have to work on growing weeds. They're going to be there if you don't do something to replace it. So every day, 30 minutes of either audio or a book, something that's going to make you grow. It'll feed your mind. It'll keep the momentum going. So this won't be just the one burst. This will be the one that got you going. And then you keep the momentum by doing this. And then finally, and most importantly, many people, the most silly question I'm asked in the media all the time for 40 years is, don't you have bad days? Don't you get upset? Don't these things happen? Of course, but I said, I don't stay there. I've trained myself like an athlete trains their muscles. I've trained my emotional muscles. Which, by the way, I think your emotional and spiritual muscles are the most important ones. Yet courage unused, does it grow or shrink? Which one? Faith unemployed, unused, does it grow or diminish? Diminishes. Passion unexpressed, does it expand or shrink? So the most important muscles that change your life are those mental, emotional, spiritual muscles. If we develop them more, we're going to experience more. So the way I do that is through a process I call priming. And this is the part that I really want you to get because it's really simple. Most of us, have you ever thought, seen someone do something and thought to yourself, what the F is wrong with this idiot? Who's ever had that thought? How many of you have ever done something yourself and thought, what the F am I doing? <laughs> okay. Many times we think we're thinking our own thoughts when we're not. We've been primed by the environment to think a certain way and we don't even realize it. Now, sometimes that's done consciously by marketers or advertisers. That's a simplistic example. But a more powerful example is what happens in your daily life. So let me give you a couple examples so you become aware of the power of priming. And then I want to show you how you can consciously prime your own mind and body and emotion so you naturally go where you want to go as opposed to hoping you go there. So some of the studies on priming have shown that what you think of your thoughts actually got there because something in the environment that you're no longer noticing. So an example of this would be uh, they did a study and they took two actors and they both approached 100 people each and the actors were designed to do the exact same thing. They walk up to people, they have the same facial expression and they'd say, well, you're sitting there, excuse me, could you hold this for me for one second while I grab my phone? and they hand you this cup of coffee and then they reach in their pocket to get their phone for two seconds and they put it back real fast and they go thank you so much and they take it back and every time they did it exactly the same way with all the people 200 people 100 each each person did a hundred people but 50 of those people they gave hot coffee to 50 of the people they gave iced coffee to now listen to this this is mind boggling after 35 to 45 minutes roughly a person walks by outdoors or at the mall wherever they did this they have a check board, you know, you know, clipboard, and they go, excuse me, um, we'll give you $20 if you'll give us three minutes of your time to read these three paragraphs and answer two questions. 95% of people do it. 20 bucks, three minutes, I'll do it. And they read these three paragraphs, which is this story about this main protagonist. And then the two questions are, tell us what's the first emotion that you link to the main character and what's the second one? 
Here's what's your question. When they do this with people they handed hot coffee to, 80% of the people, 81% to be exact, roughly 80, 81, say that the person they read the story about is generous and warm. Sometimes they add the word loving, but generous and warm is always there. The people who had the exact same presentation 34 or 40 minutes earlier were given iced coffee, 80%, there's a 1% difference which is statistically irrelevant, 80% of them say the person is cold and uncaring. And the only difference is 35 or 40 minutes earlier, somebody handed you a hot or cold cup of coffee. That's wild, isn't it? Universal Quest. Happiness is a joy that most often comes as a result of positive activity. Like wealth, it too has a wide variety of meanings and interpretations. Happiness is both the joy of discovery and the joy of knowing. It is a result of an awareness of the full range of life, the color, the sound, the harmony. And it is the joy that comes from designing a life and practicing the fine art of living well. Happiness is being able to explore the offerings of life by perception, response, and enjoyment. Happiness is both receiving and 
sharing, reaping and bestowing. It is being able to feast on harmony as well as food, on ideas as well as bread. Happiness is the deliberate act to create a wider world of experience and awareness. Happiness is having a handle on disappointment. It is being in control of both emotion and circumstance. Happiness is freedom from the negative children of fear, such as worry, low self-esteem, envy, greed, anger, resentment, and so on. Happiness is an awareness and a grasp of the positive power of life and loving values. It is an order of thought, activity, and lifestyle. Happiness is values in balance. It is contact with people of substance. Happiness is contentment with the tasks of your life. It is thought inspired by, organized with, and rooted in your personal philosophy. Happiness is a life well lived in which a wide variety of experiences are deliberately captured to become an invaluable form of currency for you to spend and invest in your own better future. You sell your dream. And what you do when you do that is you sold your children's future. You sold your own future. You sold your legacy. You've relented and you've given in. I want you to think about that. Because when you go, nah, it wasn't for me. Nah, nah, nah. That's the easy way out. Nah, I decided I'm not going to pay that big a price for my grandkids' future. I've decided I don't want to really retire my parents. I've decided I don't really want to be somebody. I've decided I don't want to accumulate enough money to fund that church. I've decided all this stuff I say about who I want to be and what I want and all that other stuff. I kind of want it contingent on it's not too hard. And that's what most entrepreneurs do. In fact, in a year of the 500 people here, there will be several hundred of you who have already sold your family down the river. And I say that to you so that you can begin to negotiate the price in advance. I love you. I want you to win. I want to see you prosper. I want to see magic happen for you. And if you don't, while you're at this meeting, all the notes, all the logistics make a decision that no matter how big the price gets, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'm going to pay. It. I've negotiated advance my will to win my family's dreams my future is not for sale and guess what we're gonna enter a market especially in the real estate space the next five years we're gonna weed out all the people who haven't made that decision we're gonna weed them all out and those of us that stay and by the way I've made the vast majority of my wealth in real estate by the way when you get any wealthy speaker that comes speak to you they either made their money in tech or real estate eventually now I cash flowed in the financial services business but I invested in real estate but I made a decision a long time ago my children their dreams are not for sale. You can't beat this dude. I'm not the smartest, right? I'm not the brightest. I may not have the, all the best information, but I'm going to outwork you and you would have to kill me to get me to stop chasing my dream. Have you made that decision? By the way, I'm looking at some of your faces. Have you made that decision? I was reading a book on forgiveness and it had a line in there that says, forgive and grow. I had to let that luggage go. You see, your mind is, is you know, when you go into a service station to get gas, you don't go in there and just start pumping. When you push the lever up, it clears the previous this bill. By the same token, if you want to begin to move, you've got to clear your mind of all the unnecessary luggage and baggage that's weighing us down. I couldn't move. I couldn't think about what am I going to do to get out of this situation because I was so concerned about what happened and what he did to me and how bad it was. I was so stuck in that I couldn't even focus on what I should have done. Feeling sorry for myself and angry and none of that was taking me anywhere. So pretty soon, I, I learned through effort, made a conscious, deliberate, determined effort. I had to let it go. I had to forgive it. Let it go and begin to focus on developing myself. And I say to you, you're going to have people to do things to you. Things are going to happen to you. And the most important thing to do is to harness your will and let it go and move so you can grow, so you can get on with your life. It doesn't matter about what happens to you. What matters is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do now, Les? Huh? How long are you going to tell everybody at the bus stop and anybody who would stand and listen to you? How long are you going to repeat the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? How many times do we have to hear that? Don't go around telling people what your story is. Everybody has a story. 80% don't care and 20% glad it's you. They say, I'm glad that didn't happen to me. Sometimes you think you've got some problems. You hear somebody else's problem, and, the, and if that problem is real bad, it make you feel good. Am I right? All right. So I had to let that go. All of us got stories to tell. So we have to be good at not only controlling the internal world, but our external world. And that's shaped by what we do. And what people do is based on their emotions and also their role models. So I thank you, Mark. And I thank all of you that are role models for people where you show people that success does not mean taking, that success can mean truly growing and giving. That money, resources, and opportunity are things to be shared. They're things that are tools for a quality of life that you're able to enhance for people and for yourself and your family. Pretty beautiful thing. My father that day decided what to do was, if I failed and I've been worthless to my family, I must leave. And he did. And to me, it was the worst day of my life. I'll never forget. 
forget it. I loved him more than anything. I had four fathers. He's the one I finally got attached to. It's like, mom, I'm confused. But then finally, years later, I got the benefit of it because out of all those experiences and all that pain, that day I made three different decisions. First decision is I just decided to focus on something different than him, and that's the power we have. We get to decide what to focus on, and my decision number one is, I want to focus on the fact there's food. What a concept. Pretty cool. But the most powerful thing to change my life was meaning. I said, what does this mean? Because my father had always said, my mother had always said, nobody gives a shit, nobody cares. Don't care about anybody, they don't care about you. And that day I had physical evidence. Those you bringing food, I want you to know that's not just food. That's called love for someone. That's called hope for someone. That's called surprise for someone. And that day for me, I went, strangers care. And so I started caring about strangers. And I decided someday I'm gonna do the same. So when I was 17, I fed two families. It was like one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I went to the grocery store, I was all excited saved up all my money, went to the manager and said, I want to feed two families, this is what I'm doing, it's not for me, give me a discount. And he gave me 10%, and I thought, cheap bastard. But I went out and I delivered this food, and ironically, um, I called this church, and I asked in the barrio, a particular place, where are some families in need? They gave me two names. I put on t-shirt and jeans. I wasn't going to be acknowledged. I also didn't want somebody to be insulted, because I saw what happened to my father. And I wrote a note, said, this is a note from a friend. And I said, I just want you to know, we know you're having difficult times, everyone does at times. And I want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving, and please feel loved, take care of your family, and someday, if you can, do well enough to do this for one other family and pass it on. But love a friend, and I had it written in Spanish as well. And I'll never forget, first place I pull up, this rotten old van, stick shift van, that I borrowed from a buddy of mine, with all these bags of food. And I went into this place and got out, pulled up this little tiny building, really tiny, knocked on the door. And when I knocked on the door, this little woman opened the door, it's probably half my size. She's not hard, I'm six, seven, so she's like five, two. And she looked up at me like this, and she saw the groceries and she screamed. She started to grab my head and pull it down and kiss me. I was like, no, 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 delivery boy, delivery boy. And she goes, no, God gift, God gift, God gift. This is too big for me. I cannot do this by myself. I'm going to forgive myself for not being Superman and not being bionic and not having the answer to everything. And I'm going to forgive myself because I can't answer all questions and I can't fix all problems and I can't be there for everybody. I'm tired. I'm going to let myself be a person and I'm going to let somebody see my person. Ooh, that's, that's some scary stuff right there. Let somebody come if the wrong person see your personhood, you know? So fear stops us from letting anybody come close. And let's face it, most of the people who want to come close and serve in ministry, they come for the wrong reason anyway. Most of them come for the wrong They don't mean, they're not di di diabolical. <laughs> They're, they're not diabolical people. They're good people. But I teach people this, and this might be worth noting. The church is both an organization, organized structure, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, deacons. It's an organization. It has to have structure. If it doesn't have structure, it doesn't run right. This meeting is effective because they have structure and order and plans. They don't just come in here and see what the Lord's going to do. Yeah. It's more than anointing. It's planning and structure and strategy, okay? So the church is an organization, but it is also an organism. It is an organism. It is a living thing. It is a divine thing. It is. It, it has the DNA of God in it. It's the birth of his daddy. It's got his daddy's blood in it. It's supernatural. It's divine. It's powerful. And if your church is not both, you'll never be effective. If you have God's DNA, but you have no organizational skills, it will kill your church. If you have lots of organization and structure, and yet you have no divine DNA in you, it will still kill your church. You will be ordered and strategic and organized and be all together and have no life, no zoe, no power, no unction, no semen, no, no none of God's sperm exists in your ministry. It's just all straight and neat. It's like a nursery without a baby. I've seen churches all over the place, organized as they could be and just they're dead as four o'clock in the morning. On the other hand, I've seen churches that were on fire for God, but no structure and no order. And both of neither one of them can grow because if you have one without the other, you can never get it done. A lady said to me that I met once in New York. She was vice president of this company. She made big money. I don't think she finished her high school education. She was still young with a young family. And I said to her, how did you get here? 
This is a tough business. You make big money. You didn't graduate from high school. What happened? And she said, well, let me tell you part of the story. She said, years ago, one day I asked my husband for $10. And he said, what for? She said, by the end of that day, I had promised myself that I would never, ever ask for money again. And she said, yes, I am vice president. Yes, I do make big money. Yes, I am young. Yes, I did not graduate from high school. But she said, I promise you, Mr. Rowan, from that day until this, I have never asked for money again. She said, I started searching for opportunity, found it, started taking some classes, learned the skills, totally changed my life. I'm sure she would say that was one of the days that turned her life around. There is a day, seemingly like any other, when everything changes. It's the day when you make the decisions once and for all to walk a new road toward the goals that until that fateful day have only been misty dreams. It's the day you say, I've had it with living a life of poor health, an empty bank account, and broken promises, where you're suddenly filled with the resolve to do whatever it takes to finally live the life you have always known you are capable of living. It's the day when you're filled with the awareness that time is precious and that each day that passes by unnoticed is like releasing a helium balloon into the sky. Soon, it will be a distant memory, never to be seen again. It's the day you decide to seize those precious moments and make every one of them count. It's the day that turns your life around. You've got to do this. I was going to give a presentation and this voice inside of me saying, you can't do this. You don't have everything it takes. I shut up. I am behind on my bills and you're telling me what I can't do. I have got to do it. You'll get scared sometimes. Your mind will go blank on you. Some people you will allow to unnerve you. And you wonder, what's wrong with me? I'm not crazy. That's why you've got to learn to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to stand up inside yourself. Working on yourself, watching that inner dialogue, it will determine the quality of your life. I don't believe this. I know this. I've had a challenge of losing weight. I'm walking through the airport. This voice say, why don't you have some M&M peanuts? No! Well, just one. Then after you eat that, you might as well have a sticker now, you sucker. I mean, it's challenging. My mother fixed the kind of sweet potato pie you can't eat with your shoes on. <laughs> have to take your shoes off so you can wiggle your toes. It sticks on my fingers. It says, eat it. One little bite won't hurt. That voice, constantly. Little demons from Colonel Sanders driving my car in there. I had to say, no, 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 no. I'll diet tomorrow. I saw a skinny man get hit by a truck. <laughs>